Hey everyone, this is Josh with another cryptocurrency tutorial available for you at chaintuts.com. Today we're going to be talking about proof of stake consensus. We're going to dive into what consensus mechanisms mean for decentralized blockchains and the difference between the popular proof of work and proof of stake. So let's dive in first by talking about what uh, consensus mechanisms are for, what they actually do, and why we need them for uh, these blockchain systems. So with our normal financial system, like credit cards, checks, those sorts of things, we have intermediaries that decide which transactions follow the rules. So if you use a credit card, the payment processor, like Visa, determines that you have enough money in your account and that uh, the money that you're paying to a merchant eventually ends up in their account when uh, the charge is settled. But with decentralized systems like Bitcoin and Ethereum and Litecoin, we need some way for a global community to decide uh, what the state of the blockchain is. That is, what transactions have been confirmed uh, and who owns what balances. And so we use distributed consensus mechanisms like proof of work and proof of stake. So let's first talk about proof of work. This is the first consensus mechanism that was really used by these distributed systems and the one that's still very popular for systems like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and others. For proof of work, miners, which are people running uh, Bitcoin software that elect to participate in the validation process do, is they solve computationally difficult guessing problems. So they take a secure hash function like SHA-256 uh, in the case of Bitcoin or S-Crypt in the case of Litecoin to find block hashes that match a certain difficulty target. And what I mean by that is, every 10 minutes or so, miners on the network take a look at all of the pending transactions and they put them together uh, in a proposed block. Then what the miners do is they add a uh, random value called a nonce onto that block data and they run it through this secure hash function. Now they're doing this many millions, billions, even trillions of times. Uh, and what happens is, is that they're looking for a block hash that gives a numerical value lower than the network's difficulty target. So in a toy example, let's say we have a block and a nonce and our algorithm requires four leading zeros in our hash. That would be very easy to find and wouldn't take long, uh, but it's something that you can think about for an example. Miners would uh, put their transactions together in a block, run it through the hashes until they got a hash value out the other end that met the four leading zero difficulty target. I have some other videos out there if you're interested in diving deeper onto how proof of work actually operates. And this is just kind of a high level thing. But what you really need to take away is this. The reason proof of work helps to secure the Bitcoin network is that it's very difficult to guess what nonce value will give a block hash that meets the difficulty requirements. And so it's very expensive in terms of electricity and in specialized hardware to mine Bitcoin blocks and get the rewards of securing the network. If a miner were to act maliciously and say try to attack the network, they may potentially lose the electricity costs and hardware costs that they put into mining if they don't behave correctly. Because it's not just a system with the miners, there's also full nodes out on the network validating that these blocks meet the rules of the protocol. So now let's shift into talking about proof of stake as an alternative to proof of work. Proof of stake is a little bit more complex, but the general thing you need to know is this. With proof of stake, instead of putting up mining hardware costs and ongoing electricity costs in order to secure the network, stakers or validators stake their coins of that network as a collateral for following the rules. So as an example, for the Ethereum 2.0 network, uh, validators will stake Ethereum coins as collateral. And they say that 
you know, if that validator does not follow the rules, uh, those coins will be seized and burned. And so the risk to a validator that doesn't follow the rules or any malicious actors on the network is that they would lose the coins that they put up as collateral, which can be very, very expensive. So the validator selection process is done at random. How does this validator selection process work in comparison to the process uh, of finding a block in a proof of work system? In proof of work, it's sort of a race for the miner to find the correct nonce every 10 minutes or so. With proof of stake, we use a little bit of a different validator selection mechanism. Many proof of stake blockchains use what is called a commit and reveal scheme in order to get entropy or randomness to decide the winning validator. I find this mechanism very interesting. So what a validator will do is they will hash some entropy from their operating system's secure source and commit that hash to the blockchain. So again, for example, if we were talking about Ethereum, they would put a hash of their uh, random seed onto the blockchain. Later on, they will reveal the actual entropy itself. Now remember, a hash function is one way. So when they put the hash on the blockchain, there's nobody uh, able to go backwards from that hash to the actual entropy until the entropy is revealed during the reveal stage. This makes it so that my, or validators, rather, in a proof of stake system, cannot game the system. They have to show the entropy that gives the same hash they committed earlier. And there's no practical way using these cryptographically secure hash algorithms to try and sort of fudge the numbers, right? To, to give a uh, entropy value that would make you more likely to be selected. So then the entropy is sort of glommed together using XOR, uh, which is a bitwise operation, and used for a weighted validator selection. So with proof of work, you're more likely to come, uh, come upon the correct nonce for a block the more guesses that you can do. So essentially the more uh, electricity and mining hardware and computing power that you put into the network. With proof of stake systems, the uh, selection algorithm favors folks that put more coins up as collateral. So someone with a very small amount of coins can still be selected as the validator for a block you just have a higher chance of being selected and thus getting the rewards if you put up more coins as collateral. Now, there are some pros and some cons to proof of stake, just like there is with proof of work. I find the pros of proof of stake to be fairly compelling, uh, but there are some cons and there are some vocal critics of proof of stake out there. I encourage everyone to learn as much as you can about these systems and these arguments and determine what you think is a better uh, validation mechanism for these decentralized blockchains. One of the pros uh, that I see is that proof of stake is much less energy intensive than proof of work mining. Especially with Bitcoin, tons and tons of electricity is spent validating blocks. Now this is a very valuable tool for a decentralized system. But there are legitimate uh, environmental concerns and concerns about power consumption, especially in areas where maybe the grid isn't built to handle the demands of all of the other electricity things that we use in our day-to-day -day lives. I also think proof of stake uh, makes some very compelling arguments uh, in favor of decentralization. Both proof of work and proof of stake have some things working for them. But one of the things about proof of stake is it's simply harder to stop. With Bitcoin, mining operations are essentially companies, right? If there's an area in somewhere like China where there's a crackdown, it's fairly easy for um, some government to decide you can no longer mine and find your operation because big miners have warehouses full of specialized hardware. They use a lot of electricity, pay very high electricity bills uh, to do this. Whereas anybody running an Ethereum node on a small computer in their home can be a validator and really go under the radar in terms of detection. As well, uh, there is a potential on a very valuable network like Ethereum uh, for a higher cost of attack. So uh, this is an argument that's postulated by Justin Bonds, uh, somebody who's, uh, you know, I think 
does a lot for the crypto space and puts out a lot of good information. And his argument is that uh, the cost of doing a 51% attack on a network with the value of Ethereum is much, much more expensive than even the electricity and hardware cost is to attack a very expensive uh, proof of work network like say Litecoin or maybe Bitcoin. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I find this argument to be very interesting. There is a lower barrier to entry with staking, potentially, depending on how you look at it. Uh, for Ethereum, a full validating node requires 32 Ethereum, uh, which is very, very expensive, right? That's, you know, as of the time of making this video, well over 100,000 US dollars. But the cost of proof of work mining equipment, ASICs, is in the thousands of dollars. And then there's the ongoing electricity cost. Paired with the fact that being an independent miner uh, generally isn't very profitable. I think it's a compelling argument in favor of accessibility for ordinary folks that you could put up, say, $500 or $1,000 into a staking pool, kind of like you can with a proof of work pool, uh, but without the ongoing electricity costs that many can't afford. So it's possible with good decentralized staking pools that more people can participate in securing the network than people can participate with uh, very expensive, resource-intensive proof-of-work uh, networks like Bitcoin. Now, there are some cons to proof-of-stake, right? Uh, folks have made, I think, again, some compelling arguments against proof-of-stake. One of them is an algorithmic problem called the nothing at stake problem. Anytime you're talking about a blockchain, you can have what's called a fork in the chain. And this means that essentially you have two competing uh, versions of the blockchain state that are both considered valid at that time that the fork is going on. So there's some history, some linear history of the blockchain, and then due to complex network events, uh, you have one side of the chain and another side of the chain being mined or validated on. With proof of work, uh, whichever the electricity cost of mining on the eventual loser of the fork, right, the one that, that is not added to the blockchain history, uh, that electricity cost is simply lost. With proof of stake, you can have uh, a validator validating on both sides of the fork with no real consequences for that loss. And so consequences have to be built into the algorithm. Ethereum has penalties for mining or validating on both sides of a blockchain fork that help to mitigate this problem. You know, another downside that people have said, which I personally don't buy uh, as much as an argument, is that proof of stake, since you stake coins and then get rewards, and that's a weighted uh, mechanism for determining the next validator, that it sort of favors the rich, right? Um, as somebody accumulates Ethereum and stakes it, they can accumulate more and more and have a higher and higher chance of being selected as the validator for blocks down the road. I would argue that although this may seem like a con, this is what happens with mining operations as well. It is very, very expensive to become a large Bitcoin miner. Hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in mining hardware costs, and again, the ongoing electricity bill uh, to continue mining. So in that way, miners can also reinvest their profits and become a larger and larger piece of the pie when it comes to who decides the block history. Now, the final pitfall of proof of stake that I think is, is fairly well understood by folks uh, that both like and dislike proof of stake is the fact that it is more complex. Uh, proof of work in a technical sense is fairly simple to implement. And proof of stake, in order to mitigate some of these problems like nothing at stake, in order to have a good weighted selection algorithm, requires a lot more complexity to get right. And so, like any piece of complex software, there can be bugs, and it's important that engineers take a close look at the code to make sure that everything works correctly and fairly. This is something that over time, the development community of protocols like Ethereum will continue to improve on, just like the Bitcoin protocol has improved on various aspects of its security and bug fixes and those sorts of things. So I hope you have found this to be an interesting look at the concept of proof of stake. 
Uh, as Ethereum, the second largest by market cap cryptocurrency, moves towards proof of stake in the future, I'm excited to see how this affects uh, you know, the ability of folks to participate in securing these decentralized blockchains. I think it's a very exciting technology, and I think that you know, proof of work will continue to coexist with proof of stake as we go along. As always, I hope you found this interesting and informative. I have lots of other uh, cryptocurrency and security and cryptography tutorials out there. Uh, so please do like, subscribe, and share, and uh, stay fascinated.